Greetings. Welcome. Welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose Seiler, and I'm the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Michael and Stephen will be speaking about prairie pastures, grassland vigor, and grazing effects as observed by satellites from 2000 to 2023. Um, I'd like to start by saying we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For millennia, they've worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I'd like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. And before we, we really get going, I'd like to note that PCAP Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation about anything to do with prairie conservation or species at risk. And we will be hosting a webinar on November 21st about growing Canada's native seed industry by Rennie Grills. Um, and you can register for Native Prairie Speaker Series webinars on the PCAP website. And most of our past webinar presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel. Um, this webinar will be uploaded there in the near future as well. Um, around, reminder to our listeners out there, as we have almost 300 people registered for today's webinar, you'll be muted for the duration of the webinar, but if you have questions at any time during the presentation, just type it into the Q&A section of the webinar dashboard. Um, if you're using a cell phone app, you can send your question by chat to the organizer, and questions will be answered towards the end of the webinar. If you have the same question as someone else, you're also welcome to upvote it um, or reply to other people's um, questions too. Um, I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association, North American Helium, Nutrien, um, Cattle, the Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, and SaskTel. Um, In-kind support has been provided by Environment and Climate Change Canada, as well as the University of Saskatchewan. And without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters. Uh, so Michael Fitzsimmons has a PhD in PAG and has worked for 38 years on numerous vegetation and wildlife management programs on federal lands within Saskatchewan. He recently retired from his position as a habitat biologist at the Canadian Wildlife Service, and he hopes to continue working in support of wild habitats with Taifa Environmental Research and Consulting. And Stephen Yu um, has a PhD and is a remote sensing specialist dedicated to advancing the monitoring and management of grassland ecosystems. He is currently a Living Skies postdoctoral fellow at the University of Saskatchewan. And he conducted field research at the Prairie Pastures Conservation Area and other Saskatchewan rangelands while completing his PhD in geography. So with that, I'll pass it over. Okay, thank you very much, Caitlin. Thanks for joining our webinar today. I'll just share my screen and get this started if I can find the right buttons. So Stephen and I are gonna discuss observations we gleaned from satellite data for the Prairie Pastures Conservation Area in Southwest Saskatchewan. Um, we're going to tag team the presentation. We do have a third collaborator, Professor Shulin Guo, who's the head of the Geography and Planning Department at the University of Saskatchewan. So this research and monitoring project has been supported by both Environment and Climate Change Canada and the University of Saskatchewan. So our outline is pretty straightforward. I'm gonna present the introduction and study area description. Stephen will present the methodology and begin the results. I'll finish the results and we'll both present some of the discussion items. So the inspiration of this work includes a paper co-authored by Dan Dan Shu and Shulin Guo on grassland ecosystem health published in 2015. The paper describes three components of ecosystem health, vigor, organization, and resilience and describes how they might be measured using remote sensing. This presentation focuses on the first of these three components, vigor, which includes indicators such as primary productivity and green biomass. So Don Gayton in his book, The Wheatgrass Mechanism wrote that deserts dream of prairie and prairie of forest. In this context, our working assumption is that vigor has directional meaning, that more primary production in green biomass is desired and less is undesired. So why, why would we use remote sensing? 
It's our contention that it's extremely difficult to collect ground-based data on vegetation vigor at desired spatial scales and temporal frequencies for large and remote pasture landscapes. One study for which field measurements of monthly productivity were collected for a native prairie ecosystem in Saskatchewan was the Matador Project. This was part of the International Biological Program that took place in the 1960s and early 1970s. It was a multi-million dollar project even in those days, and it encompassed only a few square miles. To collect such data in an area of hundred square, hundreds of square miles, it would be infeasible. So remote sensing is no replacement for human eyes in the ground, but it may provide supplemental information on management issues and independent evidence to support management decisions. My approach to research has always been to act as a landscape observer and let the earth speak. In this study, with the exception of field work in 2022 that Stephen will present, the study authors were passive flyover tourists. We will present what we observe from afar, but we certainly recognize that others may have observed very different results on the ground. Our basic questions are what factors are most closely associated with patterns of green up at the Prairie Pastures Conservation Area? And more specifically, what are the relationships between grazing patterns and grassland vigor? We tried to parse our observations at the scale of fields, fenced areas that can be grazed independently. Fields are the fundamental spatial unit used when managing grazing. Stephen will explain the term NDVI in the methods section. For now, let's just suffice to say that it's an indicator of vegetation greenness. It's not a new measure. It's been around since the 1970s. Based on the results of a previous study, we hypothesized that precipitation would be the best correlate of tempor temporal variation in monthly NDVI values, and that NDVI would exhibit positive relationships with elevation and that at, at observed stocking rates, grazing effects on NDVI would likely be overwhelmed by weather variability. The observed stocking rates were 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 AUMs per hectare. We want to recognize at the outset that this is an observational study, not a manipulative experiment. It seeks to find associations between phenomenon rather than evidence for cause and effect. Nevertheless, we find it difficult to avoid terms such as influence and effect. And they'll likely slip out during the presentation and the subsequent con conversations. So we'll just move on to the study area description. Environment Canada's Prairie, Prairie Pastures Conservation Area was formed by Ag was formerly Agriculture Canada's Govanlock National and Battle Creek Community Pastures. It encompasses 800 square kilometers or over 1,200 quarters of land in southwest Saskatchewan. The area has a semi arid climate, meaning that evapotranspiration exceeds precipitation. Mean field elevations range from 840 to 940 meters above sea level. The vegetation is dominantly uncultivated native dry mix prairie, but there are many areas seeded to tame grasses. This is a cheesy map from our Environment Canada website for the Prairie Pastures Conservation Area. And it, the area with the purple cross hatching is the Govanlock National and Battle Creek Pastures. Consul is up here at Highway 21, so it's just south of Consul, and it's all adjacent to the United States in the south. So vegetation dry matter production is approximately 500 kilograms per hectare. This production was grazed by bison herds prior to the late, 1980, late 1800s. And the landscape has been continuously grazed by local producers' cattle for over 70 years. Currently, there's two field staff, full-time field staff. I'm assuming I got this picture from our shared drive, so I'm assuming this is one of them um, out there riding. This is going to be my only horse picture in the, in the presentation. So... 
the Native Plant Society of Saskatchewan did a, a range health assessment in 2020, and they identified some important grasses that were commonly occurring in the in the in the, in the national and pasture at least. June grass, Sandberg's bluegrass, needle and thread, northern wheatgrass, and blue grammar were the most frequently found grass species. The tame fields across the PPCA are primarily Russian wild rye and crested wheatgrass. So I'm going to pass it over to Stephen, who will talk about our methods. If I can figure out how to stop sharing. OK. Oh, you're muted there, Stephen. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. And uh, I'm going to talk um, a little bit about the um, methods as well as a part of the results. Um, as you can see, we have various monitor targets for the pasture management aspect. Um, I think most of them are based on the above ground biomass, which is kind of a key indicator for the productivity, for the pasture productivity. And I divided into the total biomass, the green biomass, including the green grass for current year, as well as the swap and shrub, and the dead biomass, which is majorly controlled by the litter and the standing dead grass. And in addition of the ground biomass, we are also focusing on different aspects as well as uh, such as the fractional cover and the leaf air index and the canopy heights. Because all of these monitor, monitoring targets, they are having the physical meanings for the grassland uh, management. Um, and uh, most of them are having, uh, have the physical units of the management. However, um, this kind of measurements for, this, for the targets, they are very hard to get due to the labor cost issue, as well as the large vast region we are talking about in the PPCA. And um, what we have done is we selected 16 one hectare sites in the PPCA during the field campaign in July 2022, and sampled eight quadrants for the biomass clipping. And uh, in each of the quadrants, we divided the biomass into the following different categories, and uh, including the litter, green grass, standing dead, swamp shrub, moss, lichen, bare ground. And uh, this sorting is kind of um, <laughs> tough and very um, boring doing inside of the room, I can tell you. And uh, here is the map showing us the 16 um, sites selected for the field campaign. And uh, we have um, almost evenly distributed all these 16 sites along the three pastures in the PPCA region. And uh, here is a field um, uh, work site design. As you can see, we are using a crossing four arms um, going into the north, east, south, and west. Each of, the, each of them are having 15 meters long. So therefore, it's um, uh, one hectare for one size. And uh, for the 15 arm, we have five different plots. For the even number of the plots, we perform the clipping of the biomass. And uh, for all the five um, plots and each arm, we perform the fraction um, coverage estimation as well as the leaf air index and uh, the spectral reflectance um, measurements using the spectral radiometers. Uh, showing in the C. And uh, you can see we took back all the biomass into the uh, room and uh, performed the um, sorting um, by the categories we introduced in the previous slides. And uh, in the biomass sorting, as we mentioned, we only uh, picked eight quadrants and each size following the rule we performed in the Grassland National Park which suggested eight quadrants should be fairly good enough to represent the site situation. 
and uh, for all the different uh, biomass categories, we divided into um, three or two different uh, uh, classes. The first is the green grass, the fork, and the shrub. And the second is the dead biomass, uh, which are majorly controlled by the litter attached to the ground mostly, and the standing dead, which are maintaining the uh, vertical structure, but uh, they are either coming from these years due to the lack of moisture and water, and uh, maybe coming from last year because it's not decomposed yet and still having this kind of vertical um, structure. And uh, all the biomass, they are converted into the uh, gram per square meter unit. And here is showing you what we have done. You can see we have two more of these uh, uh, these bags for all these sites. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the satellite remote sensing of the grassland and the rational. And uh, we are talking about the optical sensor uh, in our study. And uh, what is um, useful for us is it can provide us of the repeating as well as the multi-spectral reflectance for the fixed region. And uh, in this region, we have the grazing introduced by the um, AAFC, as well as after the transition by the uh, CWS management staff. And uh, in addition, we have this kind of different uh, topography, as well as the uh, climate or the weather condition for each year. As for the NDVI, the normalized uh, uh, different vegetation index, um, it is using the red and the near infrared band to represent the, the uh, ground situation. Um, more specifically, we are using the remote sensing proxy uh, for the grassland uh, biomass. It is uh, indirectly detected by the satellite sensor, and uh, they are having no physical meanings, just the, the relative measurements to indicate the condition of monitoring targets. And the mechanism of the green vegetation is uh, the continuous reflectance curve from 500 nanometers to 2,500 nanometers is showing like this. You can see in the red and the near infrared bands, the green healthy vegetation, um, they absorbed a lot in the red, however, reflect a lot in the near infrared band. So therefore, normalized difference vegetation index, it is using the two bands to calculate the normalized value to represent the abundance or the health status of the vegetation in the ground. As you can see, I'm using the same months, but in different years for the contrasting. The bottom one is from 2022, and the um, top one is from the 2021. The NDVI can show us the effect for the drought, as well as the spatial variance among different fields in these three pastures. And uh, generally speaking, the NDVI is a very good proxy for the leaf air index for the green biomass, as well as the chlorophyll concentrator in the leaves. So hopefully it can be used as the biomass indicator for the grassland management aspect. And uh, for the satellite data, what we used is a 16-day compo uh, composition product from the MODIS which is a long historical sensor uh, launched back into the um, 2000 and 1999. Due to this kind of historical uh, data, we can extract the NDVI from 2000 to 2023, and that is 24 years in total for previous situations. And for each year, because we are having the 16-day composition, um, therefore, uh, one calendar one calendar year it has 23 terms covering from the first day to the last day and uh, the pixel size is 20 uh, 250 meters and uh, we are choosing uh, 36 ppca fields uh, by the following criteria the reason why we are using these uh, these three criteria is that we would like to keep the baseline uh, as uniform as possible just to exclude all the other um, disturbance for our future analysis. 
and um, the 36 fields selected is showing in the uh, map like this. And uh, in all of them, I think we have um, uh, 29 for the native uh, fields and seven for the tame fields. And uh, for other input data, we used uh, the elevation data from the uh, Natural Resource Canada for each field. And also uh, we dig into the annual stocking rates provided by the AAFC uh, and the uh, ECCC for each field. And uh, using this kind of different uh, um, AUM factors for the cows, bulls, and the yearlings in the field, respectfully. And uh, for the daily uh, total precipitation and the average temperature, we used the two sides from ECCC and the one side from the NOAA to do the inverse the distance weighting interpretation. And uh, here is the illustration for the general, uh, general um, DEM in this region. And uh, as you can see, we have some kind of creeks among the three pastures. And uh, the higher elevation are relatively in the north, but the lower elevation relatively um, close to the border. And the three sides, one is in Arbota and one is in Saskatchewan, and another is in Montana. Those three sites are the closest sites we can find from the available open um, data source. And uh, they are having the continuous monitoring back into the 1980s. And that is the reason why we are using that. that. And uh, for the field uh, measured data analysis, uh, it's quite uh, straightforward. We use uh, the field measured uh, spectra and uh, uh, convert it into the board band and then calculate the normalized uh, difference in vegetation index, the NDVI. Um, in addition, we can see we also sorted the biomass and then try to link the biomass the, with the NDVI by using the one factor regression analysis. And after the initial um, comparison between the biomass and the NDVI, we dig into the components of the diff different categories of the biomass and the trim the original data to do the future um, regression by dropping three sites. Uh, and then we can get the NDVI relationship with the total biomass as well as the green biomass. And uh, for the flow chart of the satellite data processing, we are using the uh, different data inputs, including the introduced one for the weather data, for the DEM data, for the grazing records data. And uh, by using them, to do the extraction for each field as a 36 selected. And for the NDVI, we performed the extraction for the NDVI series in the Google Earth Engine platform, and then do the statistic analysis from 2000 to 2023 in the QGIS, and try to link the relationship between the NDVI with the uh, stocking rate, AUM, the precipitation, the temperature, uh, the geolocation uh, factors like the latitude and the elevation. And uh, here is the uh, results for the field measurements um, and uh, the field measured biomass and the ADVI relationship. So if we used the 16 sites together and uh, using the total dry biomass for the um, dependent variable, and using the NDVI as the independent variable. As you can see, the one factor regression relationship is not quite high. The determination of a coefficient, the R square, is no more than one zero is no more than 0 0.1 uh, for the 16 sites in total. And uh, for the total green, which is only including the green grass, the fob and the shrub, dropping the data biomass, as you can see we can increase the R square from uh, 0.03 to 0.11. And uh, that is uh, 16 sites um, included together. However, if we drop it uh, three sites, as I circled in these two figures in A and B, the regression um, has been improved a lot. I mean, if we looked at the 13 sites left, and the regression 
uh, is quite good for the 0 0.3. And uh, the total green is even higher. It, uh, it's very close to the 0 0.5. And uh, by the way, the p-value for the regression showing in the BCD, they are all significant. The p-value is below 0 0.05. But uh, for the uh, regression A, that is uh, um, not significant. And that is only below 0 0.1. And uh, what happens? What is the mechanism for this magic if we are dropping these three sites? So, because we took the uh, plot photos uh, when we conduct the campaign, and I uh, selected some of them, as you can see, the top one in the blue nodes, that is the G001 site in the Garvin log, and that is from the West 4 plot. And this one is from the B004 set, which is in the Battle Creek. And that is in the plot E4. And the last one is from the B007. And this plot is from uh, West 2 plot. And if we compare the um, detail of the components for the different biomass categories, you can see the B004 and the B007, they are having extremely huge amount of the dead biomass compared to the mean uh, total green. I mean, it's almost uh, three or um, 2.5 times in the total green. And uh, it's reasonable because we can see the BR, the um, surface is just laid into the bottom or just into the uh, different layers. And for the G001, as you can see, it has a very large amount of the shaft. So, um, what does that mean? It means the NTVI, it is a useful indicator for the, beer, uh, for the field of biomass, the field of productivity, but uh, it is also important to account for the density and the diversity of the different biomass components, aka if there is a very large amount of um, data biomass existing or the different uh, components like the sharp existing, it may diminish the power to uh, indicate the green grass biomass um, in the field. And uh, yeah, I think that should be all for my part. I will hand over to, back to Michael. And uh, thank you. OK, can you hear me again? Yeah, I can hear okay, you. OK, great. I'm stop sharing now. You can handle it. Yeah, I can see your screen. OK. So this slide is a compilation of the overall frequency. So, so we're, we've left the ground data now, and we're moving on to the back to the satellite data. So this is a compilation of all the observations of the average per field of the NDVI in any 16-day term in any of those 24 years. And here's the frequency distributions we get. So there's two lines. The red line is the native fields. The blue line is the tame fields. Um, the reason why the red line is above the blue line is that there was more native fields than tame fields. And we're using the terms native and tame. They're kind of like deemed to be native and deemed to be tame based on historical maps we have of where what was seeded and what was not seeded. We didn't do any field verification to say that native and tame um, they were actually a certain percentage native or tame. It's just how they were mapped. Um, and we left out the messy middle. So obviously there's a bunch of sites that are, that are uh, you know, a, a mix of native and tame. And we kind of excluded those. Dan Pennock was one of my grad super supervisors. And he always advised, if you want to detect differences, choose contrasting treatments. So that's why we did selected into two groups. We skipped the smaller fields. We skipped some of the, the mixed fields. And we're just going to present about the two, the two types, native and tame. So the important thing to look, look at this slide is there's two peaks, a peak on the left, which is in the wintertime, and a peak on the right, which is in the summertime. <clears throat> so in, in snow and, and, and uh, you get actually negative NDVI values. Trying to advance here. 
So we divided this distribution into two in the green box. We've is are the areas that we actually analyzed. We ignored anything in the gray box. So we're calling that latent NVVI. It it's, gets it gets perceived by the um, perceived by the satellite. We can calculate it as an NVVI value, but it really doesn't really have anything to do with green growth. The stuff that has to do with green growth is above 0.2. How did we come up with this line 0.2? Um, is partly arbitrary, but also we looked at what was the driest the landscape got in, in the deepest drought situation, which we assume there's virtually no green there. The, the amount of green is fairly trivial from a product productivity point of view. So, and that that was in say 2021 drought, July, 2021, that was where some of the fields were around 0 0.2. So just to let you know that most of the calculations that follow, we ignored anything NDVI value below 0 0.2. So this, in this slide, for each field, we identified the 16-day periods when the observed NDVI was higher than it was in the previous 16-day period. So these are periods when the satellite data indicated that green vegetation increased in consecutive observations. When we accumulate these increases and show when they occur, we again, again see two peaks. The first peak for both the native and tame fields was from the April to early July period. And note the difference in the timing of the green up. So this was kind of interesting, a verification that the satellite is giving us good information. We know that tame grass often greens up a little earlier than the native grass. And that's why we, one of the reasons why we maybe graze tame grass first, but the satellite data did pick that up. So this first peak here from, from April to, you know, very early in July. So these are the 16 days after these dates. So this point right here is June 26, two weeks after that takes us into early July. So this was the main peak. There was a subsequent peak in September but if you look at the area under the curves, the area under this smaller peak is much smaller than the area under the other peak. So we're gonna kind of ignore it. The other thing about it based on sort of analysis is it doesn't occur every year. That spring peak, spring, early summer peak occurs every year. And this other peak is sort of erratic. So, um, so, we're going to focus on the things here in this sort of yellow orange box. That's what we're going to analyze and present. Certainly there is another peak. We leave it to other researchers in the future if they want to, if they want to study that, but we're not going to talk about it today. So this is, this is interannual variation. So this is, the mean of all native fields, and it's the sum of the NDVI above baseline. Some of the NDVI values above 0.2 over the, the, that spring and early summer period and how it changes from year to year. You can see 2001, everybody remembers 2001 was a really strong drought and 2001 shows up as the lowest year of all. According to this, um, you know, 2016 was a very productive year. And you can see those match between the native and the tame fields. The patterns of up and down are, are very similar. So compare that temporal variation. And, and um, there was actually sometimes in the wettest year, it's over twice as productive as in the in the um, driest year. Whereas the sum of that that NDVI above latent 
comparing the most productive fields to the least productive fields, we find a difference of about maybe 20%. So this is the upper quartile of fields. This is the lower quartile of fields. And, and from the top to the bottom, there's about a 20% difference. So the temporal variation is far outweighing the, the um, spatial variation. But when you map it, you can really see the pattern. So that lower quartile would be this yellow and, and the lightest kind of orange color here. And they occur all in these lower parts of the landscape. Um, and the upper quartile would be these red colors, which are up in the, in the most northerly parts of, of the landscape, the highest elevation parts of the landscape. So you can really see the productivity pattern. The, the NDVI data is, is revealing that. So the, it's a little different with the tame fields. So um, here's some examples of the relative, the, the upper and, and lower halves of the tame fields. You'll see the Govanlock fields are all in the low lower NDVI and the other fields are higher. Part of that is because the Govanlock fields, we think is their Russian wild rye and they have a bit more bare ground and therefore you get lower um, NDVI. So I just wanna go back to one. No, that's not it, okay. So this is the relationship between um, precipit the amount of precipitation in the current and previous two 16-day terms, so 48 days of recent precipitation versus the average NDVI for all native fields are the red dots, tame fields are the blue dots, and um, you know what kind of relationship do we see? So this is the mean 16-day NDVI in the y-axis and the 48 day precipitation on the, on the x-axis. And we get a kind of a quadratic, the best fit was a quadratic relationship that's leveling off. So as you get over a hundred millimeters of precipitation, your sort of benefit, at least as measured by NDVI of more rain is, is less in terms of the NDVI response. So here's an equivalent relationship with um, temperature. So we're looking at the, the y-axis is the same. The x-axis is the temperature over the current and previous 16-day term. So 32-day or basically monthly. So it's average temperature, not the highs for the day, but what was the, the average for all the hours of the day over a month. And we see, again, a quadratic pattern. And it even gets to the point where it starts to drop off. So above sort of 15, 17 and a half degrees, we're getting this kind of potential drop off. And this is one of the most concerning graphs that I think I saw during this analysis. If we think the future climate's different than the current climate, and it's gonna be warmer, there's a risk that um, the productivity of the, if the current vegetation is the same, the, the productivity could decline in the future. I, I just wanted to say, just going back a minute between these two graphs, so precipitation and temperature aren't independent of each other. So we can't assume that we can just model this all together. There's probably interactions when it's really dry is when it's really hot. So there's an interaction there. So this is the mean NDVI over the entire 24 period for each of the native fields in the red, uh, red diamonds here. And you can see there is a relationship. The R squared is 0.45, not a bad fit. The tame fields, the same, but again, it's a little different. These fields are the Russian wild rye fields. Um, they are at a lower elevation, but I'm not sure that that's what's driving all of this difference. It's a steeper relationship and a better R squared, but we're really gonna focus a fair bit on the native fields. 
So there is certainly an elevation pattern. We also looked at latitude and found a very similar relationship. We looked at longitude. We thought kind of an east-west gradient of moisture in the landscape would be detectable. And it seems to be in some years, but in a lot of years, it doesn't, doesn't really play a role. So I haven't talked a lot about grazing yet. So here, here we're going to, I wondered why, whether if the productivity changes with elevation, whether our grazing, the applied grazing that we put in the landscape also was adjusted to that productivity gradient. And it seems to be actually the reverse that the so these are the higher elevation fields at this end and the lower elevation fields at this end that we're actually grazing, we're stocking some of these lower fields higher than the, the higher fields, although the R squared value is pretty not as high. And sometimes there's explanations. Like I asked the pasture staff about this field, Nashland B2A. It's like the most productive field in the whole landscape, yet it's grazed very little. They said, well, there's a creek running through that field. It's hard to lure the cattle to the far side of that creek. So they maintain a lower level of grazing um, because otherwise that one side that the cattle favor would get really hammered. So sometimes there's reasons why this relationship is, but I thought it was just interesting that there was kind of reversal of the, the relationship between the productivity and the stocking rate with regards to elevation. So here's the, the, the grazing, um, the temporal variation in, in grazing. No, sorry, it's not it. Sorry, I just got to get organized here. I think I've got the wrong figure in here. So this slide shows the temporal variation in uh, productivity that we showed earlier. And I lost, yeah, somehow I substituted a different slide in. But so I had a slide showing the variation in grazing. And certainly the variation in grazing was a lot less than this is the variation, same slide that I showed earlier which was the variation of the sort of productivity as observed by the satellite in terms of NDVI. You get quite, you have really high years and really low years. Whereas when you look at the grazing, the grazing is very similar from year to year, although it's been dropping off in recent years. And maybe I'll try and find that slide later on. But if we look at the relationship between how much grazing there is and the NDVI response. so grazing and the peak green up are offset. So peak green up occurs earlier in the year and at least in the native fields, most of the grazing occurs in July, August, September, October. So they're offset. We can't look at this year's NDVI that peaks in May or, or early June and the grazing that occurs that year that hasn't even started yet. So we're gonna compare the grazing that occurred in the previous year to the um, to the NDVI response the following year. And so there's three hypotheses. Either the increased stocking rates are associated with increased NDVI, that's hypothesis one in the purple there. Hypothesis two is that increased stocking rates are associated with decreased NDVI. That's in the orange. 
where the null hypothesis is that the grazing and NBVI are not associated. So again, we're comparing the sum of all those NBVI above latent values over that spring, early summer period versus the previous year's stocking rate in AUMs per hectare. So this next slide is pretty messy and it'll be difficult for you to see, but we just want to, um, we'll focus on some of those individual frames later, but I just want to show this 14 years where we had data for the previous year's stocking rate for each one of these 29 fields. And we knew the NDVI responses. And only in four of those years was there a statistically significant correlation. So in three of the years, it was a positive. So these are the R values, not R squared. These are the R values. R was positive in 2011, 2016, and 2017. And the R was negative in 2021. And I guess I noticed that 2021 was a drought year and... Um, Whereas 2016, for example, is a wet year that was the highest productivity that we observed throughout the entire period. So let's zoom in on a few of these years. But in most years, it was, it was pretty level, not very statistically significant. So we'll zoom in. So I've instead of showing all of the years all at once, I'm just showing three different years together. So first in 2013, it was a pretty typical year. Again, the x-axis is the sum of all the NDVI above latent values for that spring, early summer period for each field. And the, the x-axis is the previous year's stocking rate. So 2013 in the blue dots was pretty typical of most years. There's really no relationship, R squared of, of zero, that it didn't matter whether you stocked it at, at say, point five AUMs per hectare or 0.25 or even you know close to zero they didn't have a big effect in in some years like in uh 2016 is the red diamonds you can see there is a slight positive relationship so the r squared you know, isn't very high. The slope of the line is not very great, but it certainly is statistically significant. And then in the purple was the year 2021 in the drought. Um, again, R squared of point, point 0.15, so not very strong relationship. The slope is not very, very big. Um, but there was a statistically significant negative relationship, but that was the only year that that occurred. So in summary, in most years, there's no discernible relationship between the stocking rate in year X and the April to early July NDVI in the year X plus one. And in some years, there is a statistically significant correlation, um, but it's not a strong one. So very quickly for discussion, um, remote sensing in general and NDVI in particular is a useful additional tool in the pasture manager's toolbox. We've gone through some of these reasons why that's the case. I think we've demonstrated that NDVI data, despite being collected from space, is ecologically relevant and carries management meeting it. It picked up relatively subtle differences, such as the timing of native and um, the different timing of native and tame green up and the gradient and vegetation vigor among various fields within a pasture. And I'm just gonna quickly return to this slide with that north-south gradient. There was a field study done last year by Tanis Conservation Services. And they looked at this field NA1, National A1 at the US boundary National A2 and National B2A, which is that very productive field. And they found, based on their field inventory, 11% higher ecologically sustainable stocking rate that they estimated based on very detailed field work of all the different vegetation polygons in those fields. And the NDVI over the past 20, 10 years, 
I looked out showed a 13% um, greater uh, NDVI in field B2A than in field A1. And I thought it was an interesting correspondence in two completely different methods, boots on the ground and a satellite method. So I'll let uh, Stephen talk about the next few slides. Yeah. So uh, if we look at MC slides, uh, remember the figure we showed from the field comparison between NDVI and the biomass, and that they are having the 0 0.4, 0 0.3 R square for this regression. And if we can assume that there is a relationship between satellite observed NDVI and the vegetation vigor or the productivity, we can say, then for the 24 years of historical analysis, it suggests that it suggests that biophysical factors with the strongest relationships uh, to productivity and uh, our precipitation, temperature, and elevation showing in that order in these slides. And uh, this can make uh, intuitive ecological sense since low temperature and high, uh, low precipitation and high temperature are associated with the poor condition of the uh, growth. And uh, one step we would like to um, consider is when the mean temperature is beyond 15 degrees, and uh, then the productivity is showing the decline trend, which is quite reasonable given the uh, situation. Most of the uh, native species here, they are cool season C3 plants. And uh, also, um, if we are looking into the future climate, we can see um, there will be unlike that of the past. And there is a risk of the current vegetation will be less productive, uh, productive than we have observed in the 20 uh, in the past 24 years due to the climate change and the increasing temperature. And uh, the productivity is also influenced by the topography position. As we can see in the north, it has a higher value of this accumulated 24 years NDVI, but in the south, um, it has the lower value. And uh, we um, assume if there is kind of high elevation as the cold air rises, it cools off and release more moisture into the field and can explain why the higher observed NDVI and the higher elevation. And uh, however, we can see these three factors, I mean, the precipitation, the temperature, and the elevation, they are just uh, not controlled by the pasture manager. It is uh, the major issue is still for the grazing. Uh, could you please go into the next 22? Okay. So, so I think we're we're running a bit short on time, and I I wanted to leave some time for questions. So, so we have a few more slides, but and maybe we can get into them if if we get some questions. But, um, maybe we can just skip over them really quickly. So, um, again, grazing. We had only limited evidence that grazing was affecting what we could see from satellite with the NDVI. Um, certainly, there were some limited limitations of the study. We violated a lot of statistical assumptions. The infra space is limited. Um, but what I wanted to suggest at the end is that really NDVI should be in operational use by pasture managers, that we should have this kind of data say monthly to look at, because um, I think it could be helpful for grazing decision-making. And there's lots of areas for future research. So why don't we just wrap it up there and I'll throw it back to Caitlin and you can give us some questions. First of all, thanks so much, both of you for the fabulous presentation. Um, really informative and really detailed. The amount of work that, that you've both done is really incredible. We do have a couple of questions that have come in already. And to any of your attendees, um, if you have any questions, now is the time to type it into the Q&A section of the webinar dashboard. Um, and Michael and Stephen, feel free to just sort of, um, whoever wants to jump in and answer it. <laughs> um, so the first one is from a listener named Jesse. Um, is the data available anywhere to try some analysis ourselves? Well... <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Contact us and we'll we'll try to make the data available for you. I don't think we have it ready to download at this point, but I don't see why it would not be available. Okay, perfect. That's great. Um, and Jeff said, in looking at previous year's grazing intensity with NDVI, did you look at any fields that were rested or not grazed at all? Yes, we did, but it, it was very erratic. So, so one of the limitations of the study, there was no control areas that weren't grazed for long periods of time. Similarly, there were no areas that were heavily grazed on a continual basis. So that's one of the reasons why we think we didn't see a very clear response in NDVI. It's fairly light to moderate grazing, um, mm -hmm. but, but there were some years where, um, I'm just trying to bring back this one slide here, if I can just share this over again. So you can see there's zero, previous stocking rate is zero here. So this one we're, blue we're, dot. We're not at the right. We're not seeing it. We're at the wrong monitor maybe. Okay. I don't know if you can just drag the presentation over to the other one. Let's try Let's this one more time. Okay. So the one blue dot at zero here in, in 2013 and three three or four were actually rested here in uh, 2016. And you can see, even though they were rested, you know, they cover the same range of variation as some of the ones that were grazed very, fairly moderately. So there were occasionally rested sites, but Again, it was an observational study. In the future, maybe we could purposely rest sites and then look at the NDVI responses mm. and do it in a more planned way. Right, very interesting. Um, and another attendee said, very interesting study um, to study and look at, but can you describe further how a pasture manager can make decisions based on seeing this product? Um, I'm making some assumptions of what they could do, but what do you suggest? Well, I, I think like this, this was a year where it, it was a bit strange. This was coming out of that 2021 drought it, and May of 2022 was also a drought. It was super dry and all of a sudden in started to rain in June and July, it started to green up. And, and we as new managers of this area were, um, confounded by the fact that some of these pastures in the southwest of Govanlock, so the yellowish orange brown is really low NDVI and the green is higher NDVI, why some areas had such higher um, vegetation response than others coming out of that drought. It just so happened that some of those areas had been heavily grazed in the previous year and we instituted some ground surveys to look at those fields. I mean, there was a lot of concern. And I think had we had this NDVI information, you can sort of see that it must have rained more in the central part of the study area than it did. And that that area hadn't emerged from the drought yet. But it really, there's no fence line boundaries. Um, but nonetheless, you might want to adapt your grazing activity, either delay it or you know, reduce your grazing intensity more in one part of the, the pasture landscape than another if you had this data on a regular basis. Okay. Um, did you consider different grazing patterns or practices at all? No, it was an observational study. So just whatever the PFRA had done for grazing um, and sometimes it's different, maybe in different fields, they might salt differently. The cows are coming in and out at different times. Sometimes there might be yearlings, I, I don't know. So we just went with the AUMs per hectare. That's all we, we looked at. Great, okay. okay. perfect. Um, and another question, um, Jesse says, thanks for the presentation. Interesting topic and hopefully could lead the way for ND 
NDBI or similar data sets to be used by pasture managers. Um, is there contact information for either of you um, for follow up for information? Uh, I think it was the very last one. <laughs> very, it didn't quite get to the very last slide. <laughs> There we go. So I'm retired, so I didn't put my government email on there, but. Okay, perfect. And I'm not sure if there's a way to screenshot it here, but people will leave it up for a minute if that's okay and people can, can jot it down. Um, and then there's another question from Evan. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. Did you take a look at um, standing mass as a result instead of subsequent year NDVI? I know one common metric is available grass after a year of grazing, which helps to inform stocking rates. Um, any comments about that? Well, maybe I'll I'll let Stephen answer this. Can can we estimate? I mean, if I'm interpreting the question correctly, can we estimate litter mass um, at the end of a growing season or at, at other times? Do we have a way of measuring that? Um, we can try to uh, modeling this kind of leftover from previous years, but we cannot discriminate if it is only from the current year or it is the leftover from the year before the current year. I mean, the leader understanding that they are the, how to say, quite important the com com components of play the vital roles in the field. But uh, as long as they are not entirely consumed or consumed by the gra um, grazer, like the cattle and the cows, or they are not entirely decomposed, we can still see them in the field. We can detect it by report sensing signals, maybe not only use the NDVI, but by different uh, vegetation indices or spectral indices. But the only problem is we cannot justify which one is from which year. And they are all compiled together. We can see there is litter under the data biomass in the field. But for this year, maybe from previous years, maybe that is the dilemma or the difficulties um, to estimate or discriminate it. And uh, one another thing, one another issue is uh, um, the relationship to estimate this kind of data biomass is not as good as NDVI for the green biomass relationship. It is relatively low. Sometimes it does not have the significant reg regression um, relationship between the uh, spectral indices we choose for the data biomass here. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks yeah, for that answer. Unfortunately, yeah. the the dead biomass is the same color as the background bare ground yeah. or biological mm -hmm. crust. So we have a hard time estimating if we had nice red soil like Prince Edward Island or something, then maybe we could really tell bare ground from litter and we would get better measurements in the, at the end of the growing season, but we don't have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, well, we've kind of run out of time here, but I want to thank you both so much for the fabulous presentation. Um, there's been quite a few um, attendees that have um, written in to say thank you for the presentation. They'll be in touch. Um, great presentation, really informative, um, and they really hope that um, this leads to this is useful for pasture managers in the future. So I just want to reiterate that. So um, thank you both. Thank you. Um, to, to all of our attendees, thanks so much for catching today's webinar. Um, we've been recording it and we'll have it available on the PCAP YouTube channel in the near future. So if you know someone who would have really enjoyed it, feel free to share it um, to them as well. Um, or if you want to go back and listen to it, it, it will be there. Um, so it's a great resource. We also have another 200 webinars that have been recorded to our YouTube channel. So um, they're always available. Um, We've had a great turnout today, so I just want to say thanks again, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Catch you, and hopefully we'll catch you in our next one, November 21st, about Native Seeds. Bye now. Bye. See ya. See you.